Thanks for joining us for this symposium. I'm Bill Rapisi, President and CEO of the Lymphatic Education Research Network. Lauren's mission is to fight lymphatic diseases through education, research, and advocacy. In order to win a fight, you first have to join it. So we ask, please become a supporting member of LEARN at lymphaticnetwork.org. And we hope you enjoy today's symposium. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Joseph Dayan. I'm the director of the Institute for Lymphatic Surgery and Innovation. Uh, we just opened this in New Jersey, and it is really a pleasure and honor to be able to share our experience over the past 15 years with you. Um, I'm going to be speaking today about um, add a little color and context to surgical treatment for lymphedema. There have been great talks um, on the LEARN Symposium by other surgeons and experts, um, and we're just going to give a, a little context and background and tell you some new, exciting non-surgical adjuvants that may help you as well. Uh, we have um, we are we are proud to be supported by a number of our sponsors, and none of this would be possible without them. So we thank them. And we thank all of our supporters for LEARN. And of course, a disclaimer, this is a general talk. So this is a general experience based on my own experience. Other, other people's experiences will be different and their uh, recommendations may change. And because this is a general talk, you definitely would want to speak about any particular topic directly with your own doctor um, or care team. So I'm going to uh, jump sort of jump right in. I I started doing lymphatic surgery for over the past 15 years, have done well over a thousand lymphatic surgery cases um, and the full spectrum of them and, and visited many talented surgeons around the world, sort of from the uh, earlier days before lymphatic surgery has really come into being. Um, and this is really a collaboration, a lot of shared um, ideas and experience from surgeons all over the world. And I'm uh, just giving you my own own perspective. I started the lymphatic surgery program at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, about 10 years ago, where I, I proudly worked and worked with many people, and now have recently started the Institute for Lymphatic Surgery and Innovation at uh, ARSA. My disclosures, I'm an advisor for Stryker, uh, really in product development, and a board member of a company that's not related to this at all, and we published a book on lymphedema. Um, there's a lot of thanks, and a lot of this is collaboration. So this is our, our core team at uh, the Institute for Lymphatic Surgery and Innovation. Um, this is made of key uh, people, dedicated nurse practitioners for lymphatic surgery, dedicated researchers, dedicated nurses, and other uh, medical colleagues. So just to give a little context for lymphatic surgery, because it's it's um it's still it's still an evolving field, although these days, a lot of our individual surgeons across the world have sort of come to similar conclusions, which is a good thing. Um, and when I first was exposed to this was in Taiwan during my fellowship with Mingwei Chen. Um, he started doing lymphatic surgery around then, and I was just amazed. Uh, I'd never heard about it. Um, I'd never seen lymphatic surgery procedure. Uh, but I also had a lot of questions, and I was very skeptical. I, I, I just did not really know much. And I was taught in residency and that there was really no surgical role for for lymphedema, you know, for lymphedema treatment. Uh, I was taught that this is something that uh, stays with a lymphedema therapist, and that lymphatic surgery generally was unsuccessful at that time. Uh, but then when I reflected, I, I also realized I was really taught close to nothing in medical school and residency about lymphedema or the lymphatic system. It's just, it was a big black hole in education because we didn't think there was anything to do. We didn't do anything. And so I went back to uh, learning about the lymphatic system, basic physiology, anatomy, doing all of the literature search from way back when. And, um, and one important question is, should we even be doing lymphatic surgery? Does it work? Is there a reason to do it? But if you think about any important structure that can be injured during surgery, such as a major nerve, you would repair it. Or if somebody's having a mastectomy for breast cancer, you would offer the option to reconstruct the breast, um, as you would any important structure in the body. But for some reason, at the time that I was training, if you removed a large part of the lymphatic system, you just left it alone. And, and a good number of those 
people would, would end up with lymphedema. And that's not including patients with primary lymphedema who are presumably born with some lymphatic uh, impairment. So why wouldn't we repair or reconstruct a major injury to the lymphatic system? And this is really where my journey started um, with a priority on safety, because at that time, 15 years ago, there was really no data on outcomes. There was no uh, description on how to do a lymph node transplant, for example. Um, a lot of the uh, technical, like the suture, the the um, instruments, the imaging was just not there for, for lymphovenous bypass as we have now. And so I would say, quite honestly, the first case I did, which was the first distal lymph node transplant outside of Taiwan, was in 2010. And this was uh, um, an amazing woman, very no-nonsense, ran her own business, very busy. But after breast cancer treatment was over, she developed lymphedema. And for her, uh, like many, this was even worse in some ways than the actual cancer diagnosis because this is forever. And she did everything right, was best friends with her lymphedema therapist, but was in compression around the clock and had three major infections. Um, I had done a lymph node transplant. At that time, we didn't really have any idea about how to work up a patient. Um, we didn't know what we know now. And um, But her life had really been altered negatively. We did a lymph node transplant. Um, we do it differently these days, but this was very effective. And she didn't really require a 24 seven compression and her limb volume went down. And, and most importantly, she wasn't getting admitted to the hospital with cellulitis. So this was my first very, very first exposure. And I owe a lot to her because if it wasn't for this good result, I probably wouldn't be speaking here with you today. And so I'm going to fast forward and kind of show you briefly and quickly, but concisely, how what we know now over the past 15 years, probably in the next 10 minutes. Um, and one is lymphedema, when I, when I was uh, uh, being trained, was really thought as a purely mechanical disease. Lymph nodes are removed or there's some kind of blockage, and that's why you get swelling. Um, we know now that lymphedema is an immunologic disease. The lymphatic system is a part of the immune system, an important part of the immune system. And if you take a big bite out of it and remove a whole bunch of lymph nodes, there's gonna be a response, an immune response to that. And it's usually not a, a nice one. And what I mean by that is there's a flurry of inflammatory chemicals, um, immune system gets activated and can cause havoc, scarring, and further obstruction. And this can cause, this can happen months or even years after the surgical insult. And the lymphatic system has a, its own smooth muscle, like your gut pushes food down, lymphatic system has a muscular wall that pushes fluid up. There's no heart in the lymphatic system. So this muscular wall pushes fluid up, but that starts not functioning right. And it loses its ability to transport lymph. Um, the lymphatic system also has valves, one-way valves. So the fluid can go up, but not back down against gravity. Um, and the valves can start you know, malfunctioning. So then fluid starts going backwards. You also get leakiness through the actual wall. So lymph can leak into the fatty tissue and skin and cause swelling. And then you get a chronic inflammatory state. And the problem with that is that this generally snowballs and gets worse. The more lymph that gets stuck, the more inflamed you get, and the more scarring and the more lymph gets stuck. One major, major boon to surgery was the ability to see these structures better. So if you can see it, you can operate on it. And ICG lymphangiography we started using in the office uh, almost 15 years ago as routine. It's kind of like an x-ray for us. This is in addition to other imaging modalities we use. We typically also use uh, lymphocentigraphy, MR lymphangiography, uh, and ultra high frequency ultrasound more, more recently. But you can see this is a normal lymphatic system and there are typical uh, radial ulnar pathways. Uh, when you get into patients with advanced disease though, and looking beyond the skin like this, you don't see any lymphatic vessels here. This, all that stardust looking, uh, stuff is lymph that's leaked through the vessel wall into the fatty tissue. And then other patients uh, have different, uh, this patient with lymphedema has a very different picture on ICG. You can see this lymphatic vessel going straight into a dead end full of this fluffy whiteout. 
but that's a lymphatic uh, vessel or two vessels here that are blocked. And this would be a patient that would be a good candidate for lymphovenous bypass. So looking beyond the skin and beyond old clinical uh, staging systems is really important. And going a step further, most doctors, most people think that lymphedema really is only present when you see swelling. And, and that that really is, is not true. Uh, the disease process happens long before you see swelling. Just like I know my calcium score is elevated, I have heart disease, but I've never had a heart attack and I don't have any uh, angina or chest pain. It doesn't mean I don't have lymphatic disease. Just like before mammograms were invented in the late 60s, uh, and all you had is a physical exam, just because you can't feel a mass or see an ulcerative uh, cancer in the breast, it doesn't mean that it's not there. Similarly, for lymphedema, uh, this process happens long before you see swelling. In this woman, she would normally be told that she's just fine, but she had transient swelling. She's had an infection. She feels heavy. She has symptoms. And it's very frustrating for a patient to have these symptoms and, and be told that there's really nothing wrong just because it's not swollen. So ICG allows us to uncover, you can see in her arm, her right arm is actually uh, has significant impairment. And then finally, lymphedema is a proliferative disease. What that means is that it's not just fluid builds up, but scar and fat also build up. And that's all orchestrated by this immune response, this immune activation, where you get fibrosis, which just means scarring, uh, skin changes, the skin gets thick, um, and fibrofatty proliferation, all that means is just fat builds up. And these, these all happen in varying degrees. And this is a page, this is a, a paper uh, we had published a little while back on on uh, to, on a looking at how much fat and fluid accumulation we see in our patients. Uh, these are two different women, both with about the same amount of lymphedema in their lower leg. And normally you would stage these clinically the same, but if you look at an MRA, uh, an MR, the black is fluid, the white is fat. The patient on the left has a fluid dominant limb. The patient on the right has a fat dominant limb. And the fat component is a reason why many patients will say uh, lymphedema therapy helped me, but now it's not working as well. It could be that because fat has built up and you can't squeeze fat with any amount of compression out of the leg, nor can you get rid of fat by doing a lymphovenous bypass or lymph node transplant. Uh, the only main way we know how to get rid of fat is to suction this out or debulk it. Um, similarly, fluid is treated a different way that, that will generally respond to compression and physiologic procedures. And so these patients are not going to respond the same to the same treatment. So we really have to look at patients with lymphedema individually. And, and when we're looking at any patient with lymphedema, uh, we're looking at really three, three essential components. Of course, there are other factors but we're looking at the lymphatic system itself with imaging, whether it's MR lymphangiography, ICG, lymphocentigraphy, ultrasound. Um, and the lymph component uh, from a surgical standpoint is the, the mo two most common procedures are lymphovenous bypass, uh, where you're just redoing the plumbing and bypassing the blockage, which we'll show you, and a lymph node transplant where you're placing lymph nodes, sort of planting seeds, that then uh, stimulate growth of new lymphatics into the, into the transplanted lymph nodes. Um, this will help the fluid component. Uh, there, are, there are also variations like nodal venal bypass, which, which is um, more recently popularized by um, JP Hong, although previously described. And um, uh, there's a, there are a lot of different techniques. Um, the other component is fat, the fat component like you saw in that leg, is not going to go away with just compression and physiologic procedures. And for that, um, for, for extensive fat accumulation, uh, suction-assisted protein lipectomy or SAPL may be appropriate. This is essentially a type of liposuction, nothing like cosmetic liposuction. This is a much more extensive, aggressive, and circumferential liposuction, um, a much more demanding form of liposuction to reduce the limb. And then finally, the vein, uh, particularly important for lymphovenous bypass or lymph node transplant, if the veins have to be normally functioning, because if we're relying on shifting the lymph fluid into the vein and the vein has a lot of back pressure, 
the, the fluid's not going to get out of the limb. So this is part of the assessment. Um, up front, a patient who would be a good candidate for SAPL or lymphedema liposuction is somebody who's already living in compression 24-7 and has minimal to no pitting. Um, this is not this is a one such example, and there are some better examples, but this is a pretty pretty standard result. And this is life-changing for patients, as long as they're in compression. It's not good for patients who are only wearing daily compression or who have some pitting edema. Um, our results, even with uh, the intention of being compassionate, I think have been disappointing in those cases. And I think Hakan Brorson, who had uh, really pioneered this area, uh, was correct in patient selection. Then we have physiologic surgery, and these are surgeries aimed at re resolving the actual blockage, getting the fluid out of the limb. Uh, one is lymphovenous bypass or LVB, also called LVA or lymphovenous anastomosis. They all mean the same thing. And this is a simple plumbing solution. So you're, you're looking at that lymphatic vessel that is draining fluid waste from the limb and ending at a dead end. Um, and in scar or obstruction, and you're you're cutting it before the dead end and plugging it into a, a, a vein next door. And so instead of lymph trying to get through this blockage where it's not going anywhere, you're putting it into a vein and it's hitchhiking uh, in the bloodstream and gets out of the limb. The other one is a lymph node transplant, works completely differently. And this is really transplanting lymph nodes, which have growth factors that stimulate new lymphatics into those lymph nodes. And once those lymphatics grow into the lymph nodes, uh, they then get shunted out the vein. So these both depend on a normally functioning venous system. Um, so who would normally be a candidate for lymphovenous bypass? And this is a changing, this is a bit of a moving target because of imaging technology. So historically, um, historically, if we would see on ICG somebody with no lymphatics on the top here, we would generally... You could do lymphovenous bypass, but those lymphatics may be more scarred, um, and it may be difficult to have a more successful result. However, that's changed for us because the ICG only sees about uh, a centimeter below the skin, and so it doesn't show you the deeper lymphatics. And for this, we use ultra-high frequency ultrasound, which is now standard of care in our practice, where it's a special ultrasound where you can actually see submillimeter lymphatics uh, all the way through the limbs. You can see deeper lymphatics you would miss on an ICG. So I would say this slide is not, uh, not accurate today. However, the person on the bottom where you see that lymphatic that ends in a white patch dead end, I know 100% I'm going to be able to find a lymphatic uh, in that scenario. Uh, that lymphatic clearly is going nowhere. And so, so that's a uh, high confidence for doing a lymphovenous bypass. Generally, we used to get referred all the, all the most advanced cases of lymphatics, uh, lymphedema for, for lymphatic surgery, but we've realized the earlier we get there, where more of the system is functioning, the, the more we have to work with. And, and this is why when we see more advanced disease on ICG, you're going to see more scarred lymphatics, like the vessel in the middle. It looks opaque. It's full of scar. There's usually not as much fluid pouring out of there compared to that vessel all the way on the right, where you can kind of see the dye flowing. It's got smooth muscle function that can push. Uh, if you're doing a, a lymphovenous bypass, it can generate enough pressure to propel the lymph up against the vein, the blood coming back down the vein. You really need to overcome the venous pressure for this to work. So if you have a lymphatic with intact smooth muscle function, that's ideal because you're, you ultimately want that lymph to go up the vein. If you don't have enough pressure from the smooth muscle, the lymph's not going to go anywhere and definitely totally relies on compression. And this is what that looks like doing an end-to-end -end bypass. The lymphatic is at the bottom, the vein is at the top, but you see the vein is full of clear fluid um, instead of blood. And so this is a, you're walking out of the OR pretty confident. And then there's end-to-side lymphovenous bypass, and more recently side-to-end, um, which, which we also perform, and I'll, I'll go into that a bit more. All of these have different technical reasons for doing them. Um, and end to side basically hitchhikes on the side of a vein with faster flowing fluid, the slower flowing lymph kind of hitchhikes and gets sucked up. 
the reverse can be done where you're plugging the end of the vein into the side of a lymphatic. And that can take lymph going both backwards and forwards. And this is an end to side lymph, lymphovenous bypass. Um, you can see the ICG is in the vein and you can even see pumping. You can see that big blush uh, on the right of ICG, that, that lymphatic is actually pumping lymph into the vein. You can see it's wide open. And this is an example of a lower extremity bypass. Um, we perform the ICG on the table. This is a foot you're looking at. Uh, we map this out. We map where the blockage is uh, and we make our incision before the blockage. We find the lymphatic, which looks really swollen and congested. We find a vein next door using ultra high frequency ultrasound. And now if I cut that lymphatic, you can see lymph pouring out with high pressure. And then that lymph gets sewn to the vein. The reason why this is a little jittery is because we're under 40 times magnification. One square is one millimeter. So this is about a half a millimeter vessel, which is pretty standard, but it's very doable to do this bypass. And then you have an open bypass on ICG. And then there are questions you do end to end, end to side, side to end. I think this is an area of continuous exploration, but uh, this is with my colleague and friend, Marco Papillardo. We had done the first uh, bypass in Modena. And here you can see, uh, did a end to side lymphovenous bypass, you can see the ICG pumping into the vein. And just to see, I, I clamped the distal, the the downstream part of the vein. And you can see that the, the flow is even greater when we convert this end to end. But it, these are things that have to be quantified. We don't know for sure. Um, and we see different, all kinds of different orientations of the lymphatics. So I think every patient is different and every lymphatic is different. Um, this is an example showing uh, the hand is to the left, the armpit is to the right. And you can see the lymph flowing forward from the hand toward the armpit and the lymph flowing backward. However, in this lymphatic, the lymph is flowing backward really fast. This lymph is flowing from the armpit toward the hand. Um, interestingly, you can see this is backwards flow. And now we're going to check forwards flow. So this is stripping it from the hand to the armpit. And there's almost no flow. So you can see, even in the same patient, individual lymphatics are different. And so the type of arrangement of bypass you would use, um, if you have flow in both directions, you might want to do a side to end. If it's only in one direction, you could do an end to end or end to side. But um, I think our techniques have gotten far more sophisticated in the last few years. So um, lymphovenous bypass is minimally invasive. It's outpatient. It doesn't hurt. It amounts to one or two paper cuts, basically. A lymph node transplant is a much bigger procedure. So why would you do why would you do the big procedure? For us, the hard indication if the patient has another problem, like a painful contracture in their axilla or groin, uh, or they need you know real skin replacement and releasing the contracture. Um, these patients, a lymphovenous bypass is not going to help the pain or contracture. So we go, or if the patient has narrowed axillary vein or femoral vein from a scar, from a scar after surgery and radiation, lymph node transplants do work. We do see uh, uptake in these transplanted nodes in our own patients. Uh, there, there is a risk of donor site lymphedema, but uh, we had published on reverse lymphatic mapping, basically injecting a uh, type of dye into the foot or the hand and finding, locating exactly where that lymph node is or lymph nodes that drain the limb and avoiding them. So we can cherry pick lymph nodes that do not drain the limb and using that technique, we have not caused donor site lymphedema. Um, more, I would say in the past seven years, we've been using the omentum and gastroepiploic nodes, which are inside the abdomen along the stomach as our first choice. Um, because there is zero risk of causing donor site lymphedema. There are some risks of very low risk of hernia, but this is um, a great, great option. Um, and uh, we've discussed all kinds of specific techniques, but it doesn't help everybody. Certainly if the patients had major abdominal surgery, we wouldn't go back into the belly. Um, there are other cases like this very severe case of a patient who has skin missing, they need skin replacement. 
uh, it doesn't come with skin. So this is, you're looking at all the nerves, the fuse box of nerves supplying the upper limb in this patient with severe lymphedema. And that, that blue thing hanging out is the main vein draining their arm called the axillary vein. Uh, so we reconstructed uh, this axillary vein with saphenous vein graft um, and, a and a latissimus flap with vascularized lymph nodes. Um, and this is uh, on ICG, you can see the, the blood running from the lymph node transplant into the vein graft. Um, and now, uh, now there's good outflow. And you can see before surgery, the lymphedema therapist wasn't really able to decongest this limb, but after surgery, the therapist was able to, to do what they needed to do. And, and outcomes on, on lymph node transplant and lymphovenous bypass, we now have many studies, many higher level studies, prospective studies, controlled studies. Um, we looked at uh, over seven, 17 prospective studies, including over 1,500 patients on lymph node transplant. And so at this, at this point in time, it is not, I would not say this is investigational or experimental. This is uh, this is a, a surgery that does work. It doesn't work in everybody. No surgery works in everybody. And I think the challenges are really understanding lymphedema better and figuring out who specifically to do what type of procedure in. And, and, how, and when we understand this, as we understand this better as a medical community, we'll be able to get even better results. Um, we had performed our own prospective study on lymph node transplant while I was at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, we now have a mean follow-up of four years, but this was uh, this was done because it can be hard to interpret studies because post-operative compression is a major confounding factor. Uh, for example, a patient comes in, they haven't seen a lymphedema therapist in three years. We measure their limb, we do surgery, we send them to lymphedema therapy. Their limb is better. Was it the surgery that made the limb better? Was it lymphedema therapy? Um, it's hard to know. So what we would do is for this study, we would send them to lymph lymphedema therapy up front, and we we work very closely with the lymphedema therapy community. We need them, um, we need we need their help in order to optimize the patient from um, both pre and post op. So we we optimize them first, and then we take our baseline measurements, and then we do surgery, and then we know that any additional a reduction in volume or benefit is related to the surgery. So, um, and it's kind of like, it's kind of like, uh, taking a limb volume is kind of like taking a blood sugar on a diabetic, um, speaking as a diabetic, if you just take one blood sugar and the person just had a Dunkin' Donuts and then they see you six months later and they were fasting and they took another blood sugar, it doesn't really represent the totality. So you can, you can get a patient on a good day or a bad day. So we looked at quality of life, bioimpedance, cellulitis, need for compression, uh, we usually optimize our patients to a BMI below 30 so that their lymphatic system is functioning as good as it can. Um, and for this, we were just doing secondary lymphedema. I was at a cancer center at the time, although now I do see a lot of primary lymphedema. Uh, this was an average of 89 patients, mean follow-up of two years. And the, the bottom line for this paper was that uh, the safety was there. We did not cause donor site lymphedema about three out of four patients significantly improved. Um, about half of patients with a significant limb volume difference had a significant reduction in their limb volume. One third of patients no longer needed compression. And there was a very dramatic risk reduction in cellulitis. So this was um, done as rigorously as, as, uh, as possible and as honestly as possible. I would say that we stacked the deck against us because they were so highly optimized before surgery. Not every patient is going to be as rigorous with lymphedema therapy afterwards. So the, most of the patients aren't, aren't as uh, rigorous afterward. You would expect their limb uh, to swell a little bit. Um, and this was just a kind note from one of my colleagues at Sloan Kettering, uh, uh, of her, her breast reconstruction patient we operated on and she no longer needed to wear a sleeve. And this is such a dramatic change for a patient. Um, these are some representative cases. And keep in mind that the limb may not go down to the normal size because you still may have a fat component. Um, another example, before and after. And then like many surgeons will combine these. So this was a lymph node transplant plus liposuction. And, and you might say, 
Well, it was all the liposuction that helped her limb. But I would just point your attention to her hand because we do not do liposuction in the hand. Preoperatively, the hand was very swollen. You can even see the compression sleeve um, marks at her wrist. Postoperatively, you don't really see any compression sleeve marks and the hand is not swollen at all. It's completely normalized. So I would say that um, both the lymph node transplant took care of the fluid component, which she had significant, and, and the, the sapple took care of the fat component. So good candidates, good candidates for these cases we are looking to optimize the whole patient, not just treat the surgical defect. I used to operate on everybody um, out of compassion, but then you look at your outcomes. And then I, I saw you know com um, higher complication rates, lower, uh, lower success rates in patients that weren't optimized. And that means uh, blood sugar is optimized as insulin resistance can impair lymphatic function. Body weight is optimized because higher BMIs definitely impair lymphatic function. And we've seen a uh, um, improvement that there is no vein disease. Uh, vein disease is not going to allow for a good bypass to work because of high back pressure. So the fluid's not going to go anywhere. Um, we want the patient to work well with their lymphedema therapist, somebody who's on board with doing all their part in, in making this work. And a patient who's realistic and patient, um, lymphatic surgery is not a cure, not at this point. And um, the results for a bypass can take up to six months, although we do see some very early response to the results. But a lymph node transplant can take a, a year or two. Um, and this brings us to, to a next, the next part of the sort of very early, uh, very early uh, reports. So we had just published the first report of using GLP-1 receptor agonist, which is a mouthful. Um, I don't have any relationship with the pharmaceutical uh, industry. Um, I'm just using the brand names because nobody, most people don't know what GLP-1 receptor agonist means. So these are drugs like Ozempic or Manjaro, that type of drug that is really at this point, 6% of the U.S. population is on. So these drugs are well known. They've been used in millions of people. And if really, um, as, while every drug has risks and benefits and, and um there's still more to learn about these drugs for sure. Uh, we had seen a patient with breast cancer-related lymphedema, mild lymphedema, she presented to us. She was actually in the non-surgical control arm of our lymphatic surgery study. She did not want surgery. And we followed her. And like many women with uh, breast cancer who are treated with hormone therapy and chemotherapy, about a third of women from an MD Anderson study will gain significant weight. Their metabolism will be altered uh, in a way that's very resistant to traditional means of diet and exercise for losing weight. So this is a big frustrating problem. But the other problem is it exacerbates the lymphedema. So her lymphedema, and we had prospective data on her limb volume, uh, blew up. And now all of a sudden she's in compression 24-7. So I worked with her endocrinologist, uh, Dr. Gallagher, at Mount Sinai, and she was not. Um, she was not. She did not have a high BMI. She did not have diabetes, but her weight, twenty-five pound weight gain, definitely worsened the lymphedema. We got her on semag uh, semaglutide, and she lost twenty-five pounds. And her lymphedema essentially evaporated. Her limb volume went from ten percent to three percent, and she no longer needed compression. So this was a very early stage that got bad and then got very good. And then um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Staff Brown, uh, this was at the time I was at, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, had looked at about 10,000 axillary dissections. This is the paper on the right uh, that were performed and, uh, and uh, really narrowed this down to the years that GLP-1 receptor agonists were available uh, down to about 3,000 patients, 75 of which were on GLP-1 receptor agonists. So we looked at those that were on this drug compared to those that were not undergoing an axillary dissection. Typically, you'd expect about a third of patients to get lymphedema, and certainly exactly that, uh, almost exactly that, about almost 30% of all patients in the non-drug arm were uh, got lymphedema, but the GLP-1 group had an 80%, 85% risk reduction. Um, and that, that's, a, that's a big difference. 
Um, this is a registry paper. So this is looking back, it's retrospective. This is not high level uh, scientific study. And this is not a definitive study by any means. This is really testing the waters to see if there's any potential benefit, um, any potential signal out there that this drug actually helps. So we are in the process of rolling out a prospective study and that's what we need, prospective study on these types of medications. Um, but anecdotally, we've treated over a dozen patients that have elected to go on um, GLP-1 receptor um, agonists with their doctors and have noticed a significant improvement in bioimpedance and lymph volume and overall suppleness of their skin. But this is something that needs to be really studied. Again, this is not, uh, we don't endorse this based on a case report and a registry study. There are multiple confounding factors um, with, with this kind of, this very limited evidence. But I do think this was one of the most exciting things because coming from the patients, if you actually speak to the patient, they're the ones telling us um, uh, their, their results. Um, I myself am on sem sem semaglutide for diabetes. So it's not, a, it's not a, uh, I don't, I wouldn't uh, discuss any drug lightly. Um, all these have uh, their own risks and benefits. Um, we did look at cancer risk, which is a, a, always a concern for a cancer population. Obviously, there are plenty of patients with primary lymphedema for which uh, this does not apply, but um, the, the large, large population studies uh, have not really concluded uh, definitively that there's any grave cancer risk. However, when looking specifically at breast cancer, in addition, vitro, uh, hormone sensitive tumors seem to, uh, there seems to be a, a tumor suppressive effect. Again, this is in a dish, not in a human being. Um, triple negative tumors, it seems uh, based on one paper in, in vitro in a dish or in um, a rodent model, seem to uh, increase uh, expression of, uh, in, uh, potentially uh, increase uh, cancer growth. So again, these are, these are very, the singular publications and small publications. There's a lot more that needs to be studied, but um, we've seen a lot of promise. And the other thing that we're looking at when we're optimizing patients um, is not just weight, but insulin resistance. I'm on a continuous glucose monitor and everybody's metabolism is different. So I, I put a, um, I eat some rice and my sugar goes way up. It may not touch another patient and it doesn't necessarily correlate with body weight at all. So I, I think uh, doing continuous glucose monitoring, which is now over the counter for a few weeks is a very useful a uh, healthy thing to do for really anybody, but particularly if you have lymphedema, because reducing um, reducing the glucose load can can improve lymphatic function. And so, finally, can we reduce the risk of lymphedema at the time of of a dissection or removal of lymph nodes? And uh, this has been you know described by um, Bocardo, and I visited Corrado and Corradino Campisi. I mean, real giants um, in this area. I, I, they've been wonderful. I'm grateful to so many people around the world. J.P. Hong, Akitatsu, Hayashi, um, Hidehiko Yoshimatsu, um, Jama Masia, so many, many, many people, Giorgio DeSantis um, and others. But you can see this is at the time of axillary dissection. We connected the lymphatic, the lymphatics to a vein, and you can see the vein filling up with, with lymphatics. So why not reconstruct the lymphatic system if you're cutting out all those lymph nodes, at least give it a chance um, for an exit um, instead of just leaving those lymphatics clipped going nowhere. Um, and and uh, my, my colleague, Michelle Caridi, who had spearheaded this uh, randomized prospective trial at Memorial, which I had uh, uh, pleasure and pride to take part of, showed at 18 months basically reducing the risk of lymphedema from one in three uh, who does not have reconstruction at the time of axillary dissection to one in 10. And there are many articles in other centers on this topic. Um, but what about pain and contracture? This is a smaller study we published. Um, these, are, these are some of the patients that we see with horrible contracture and pain, disabling pain. So if you're looking at a defect like this in the operating room, very big defect, you know, filling out that soft tissue, ideally with lymphatic tissue, 
and it is much more preferable covering those nerves, those critical blood vessels, and also avoiding a cosmetic deformity in, in addition to the functional one by simply putting omentum, gastroepiploic lymph nodes. It actually doesn't take that long. Um, then after radiation, as this patient had radiation afterward, had full range of motion, no pain. Um, this patient had an immediate deep flap with axillary reconstruction, no, um, you know, no cosmetic deformity, scarring or contracture or pain, because you're covering all those sensory nerves with nice, nice, healthy tissue. And then finally, I'm going to wrap up with a very special patient, the most special patient in my entire career. Um, this is Andrew, and I actually spoke uh, to his mother earlier today. Um, a lovely, uh, lovely woman and proud mother who um, uh, was was kind enough to fully support uh, sharing his case with us. Andrew had um, had thyroid cancer. He had uh, bilateral neck dissections and extensive radiation. And he actually had um, um, a metastasis to the to the left uh, um, the left uh, supraclavicular lymph nodes. So he he had uh, his internal jugular vein tied off on one side, but the radiation had occluded the vein, blocked the vein on the other. So he had both no ve venous drainage out of his head and he had no lymphatic drainage and he had this horrible contracture. And because of that contracture, they couldn't put a tracheostomy, a breathing tube, so he could breathe. So he was suffocating slowly to death and he was in the office you can hear him trying to breathe. He was on a CPAP machine and nobody knew what to do with him. A hundred percent, this was getting worse. And just two weeks later, when we got him on the table, his his face and head and neck were completely blown up. Um, this was a case where um, this, this surgery is extremely risky. There was no described surgery of how to do this. Um, I worked with a team together um, and um, at, at Memorial at the time, and uh, planned to bypass both veins in his neck, do a lymph node transplant, and resurface the neck skin. Um, this was uh, the operative uh, procedure listed on top. It's a mouthful, but basically we did an omentum lymph node transplant um, for lymph nodes. We did two venous bypasses, um, and, a, and then a, another free flap to give him skin through his neck so he can have a tracheostomy. Um, the neck dissection I performed the last few hours of because there was no, no veins to find. Finally, we found veins. This is very difficult because the, it's like concrete. So you can get into the carotid artery or the esophagus, uh, either of which could be lethal. But we were able to find veins. Um, this is the omentum covering the base of the entire neck, the raw surface. We did um, sort of fancy acrobatics and microsurgical techniques uh, to drain the left side of his uh, head and neck and also drain the, the venous, the vein, the blood from the right side of the neck. Um, a lot of this is just um, microsurgical gymnastics. And then day by day, this is post-op day one, post-op day two, three, and so forth. I can tell you this brought tears to, I think, the entire team's eyes. And this was a man that um, that still went to work and would wear sunglasses because he did not want to be laid off from his job because somebody was worried that he was not able to do it. This was a, an, a, a monument of a human being. Um, and he, he really brought light to all of us. Um, and these are difficult, difficult situations where there have been, I think, along the development of lymphatic surgery, plenty of failures, plenty of shortcomings. Um, and it's important to be open and honest about those with our colleagues, with our patients. But if we did not embark on this um, using every safety measure possible, we wouldn't be able to treat and benefit the many, many of our uh, grateful patients where, where this is improve their quality of life. And I think we still have to still have to reach for the stars, both on the surgical and the medical and the lymphedema therapy spheres on really all fronts. So I want to, with that, I want to thank you so much for your patience um, and for giving, giving me your time, your valuable time, especially 
uh, to our team. There are many people along um, along along my career. I I need to thank um, longer than I could longer than I could list. Um, but this is a collaborative effort of many experts uh, around the world. Um, those include from my very first uh, Mark Smith, who I'd done some of these ca early cases with, uh, Babak Marara, who I'd done uh, other cases with at Memorial, Michelle Caridi at Memorial, but uh, many international surgeons around the world, um, and most of all, our patients. Thank you so much, and I'll I'll open everything to questions. And, and most of all, where I am now, I want to thank um, ARSA, the Advanced Reconstructive Surgery Alliance and the Institute for um, the Institute for Advanced Reconstruction. Thank you so much. I think we'll open open it um, open to questions. And I'm just looking looking in the chat. So oh, that's a good question. So what is the option for donor lymph node transplant in primary lymphedema? For primary lymphedema, it's very important to make sure that wherever you're getting lymph nodes, there's no latent disease. So for example, a patient with lower extremity lymphedema on one side, the, even, even their right leg is affected, their right leg, their left leg is affected, their right leg looks normal, they may have not a normal lymphatic system in the right leg. Um, so for those reasons, we usually go for the omentum because it's not draining anything. Um, it it um, is inside the abdomen, so the gastroepiploic lymph nodes would be my first choice. Um, if I did have to go for peripheral nodes, if the abdomen wasn't available, then I would image both using ICG and lymphocentigraphy to make sure the adjacent limb where we're taking the lymph nodes is not affected. And I'd probably go for the neck, the supraclavicular node, the supraclavicular lymph nodes. Um, David Chang had had uh, made a beautiful description of, but that that's where we go. Um, then. Uh, Yeah, no, I, I want to correct. Somebody said um, correctly that they, I think they misunderstood the first lymph node transplant. That's not what I said. I said the first distal lymph node transplant. So this was a distal lymph node transplant to the wrist. Um, but Ming Wei Chen had first described that. Um, but yes, the Corinne Becker, um, a, a, a pioneer in lymphatic surgery, actually visited her. Uh, she was very, very kind to invite me. Um, to her operating room in Paris, um, and we owe a lot to her. Um, she is the first uh, person that did lymph node transplant. Absolutely. Um, the I was talking and spoke about the first distal lymph node transplant, um, which at, at the time I I I I do a different version of. Um, would lipedema lead to lymphedema, and would lipedema surgery increase the risk of getting lymphedema? Uh, That's a great question. Um, Lipedema can lead, can evolve into something called lipolymphedema. Lipedema itself, uh, usually the lymphatic system is not affected at first, but in severe cases, the lymphatic system can decompensate. Just like in severe venous insufficiency cases, you can have um, the lymphatic system uh, decompensate and you get overlying lymphedema. Um, I really don't know. I don't know the answer to the question. I'm not aware of... Um, lipedema surgery I, I I just don't know so I don't want to I don't want to incorrectly comment um I haven't done a lot of lipedema surgery recently because I was mainly at a cancer center previously when fibrosis is present is there any place for low level low level laser and treatment um personally I don't use laser therapy so I'm not familiar with it so I couldn't comment unfortunately I'm aware that it's used but I I I'm not aware of the the evidence for it um what are the statistics that you have a successful VLNT and LVA only for a few years later not function per lymphocentigraphy study I'm not I'm not sure I'm not sure I understand the question but um, lymphocentigraphy, we do do lymphocentigraphy post-operatively on lymph node transplants. And the bottom line is about a third of patients, the lymph nodes will light up, although that's limited by where you're injecting and how long you're waiting for the lymphocentigraphy study. So it's a limited, it's kind of a limited study. So, um, a patient is asking, she had a lymph node transplant and LV bypass, Although it initially showed promise, but has not worked, is there anything that could help the arm? 
she wears compression and getting therapy again with cellulitis once a year, which has been problematic. Um, it's hard, it's impossible for me, unfortunately, to comment on any specific case, you know, without seeing you, but I would, you know, I would see, I would see your, your surgeon first, um, and, and maybe get uh, a variety of opinions, but that would have to be an in-person workup. Um, will compression garments be required 24 seven after surgical treatment? Um, or is the goal not to depend on the compression garments to control the edema? Um, I think that we have, just have to look at the data. In, in our own data, about a third of patients with upper extremity lymphedema do not require compression garments. Lower extremity lymphedema is more, is more challenging because you have gravity working against you. Um, but, but of course, uh, our ultimate goal is to cure lymphedema. Um, but it's not, not, not um, a realistic goal at, at, at this point. Although we have had patients that say they are cured or have come close to you know, normalization of the limb, I think I'd be very careful about making any claim. So what's the first step to determine uh, who's eligible for surgery? What type of doctor determines that? Um, that's a great question. And I think it highlights the challenges today is that lymphedema is really largely absent from most areas in medicine. So it's not like you can go to your primary care doctor and they'll they'll refer you immediately to somebody who would know. A lot of people are not familiar with lymphatic surgery. Um, and it's, uh, um, I, I would say, a lymphatic surgeon. So the uh, Lymphatic Education and Research Network has a great resource. They will have a whole list of centers of excellence for um, lymphatic disease, uh, for lymph uh, lymphedema and lymphatic disease. So primary, secondary, and all kinds of lymphatic diseases. Um, you can look on the LEARN website. Uh, what kind of results have you seen from patients who receive these procedures? About, um, as I said, about about three out of four patients, and this is very sort of sober, honest uh, reporting as best as we can. You have to measure um, what how what is a good outcome. So, you know, not everybody has a big limb volume. Some patients have mild lymphedema, but they're always in compression. So they're not really looking to reduce the limb volume. They're trying to get rid of the compression. Um, for other patients, it's recurrent cellulitis. For other patients, it is the limb volume. For other patients, it's everything. Um, so we we evaluate outcomes based on limb volume, cellulitis, need for compression, and so forth. But the bottom line is about three out of four patients have a significant improvement. Um, so I would say I would, same thing for lymphovenous bypass. Um, and I think that as we as we progress as a field, you know, all of the surgical colleagues and medical colleagues, as we progress and understand lymphedema better, I do think there will be drugs and surgery used in combination, uh, like we used to treat breast cancer and other diseases, uh, to reconstruct the lymphatic system if it's been surgically harmed, um, and also to treat the immune response. I don't think surgery alone is gonna, gonna do it for, for a cure. Um, there, there are some questions specifically about a uh, specific cases. Um, uh, one is uh, had a lymphovenous bypass with no success, um, and she had lip liposuction on the arm and just starting to see the difference. Um, had had lymphedema for eighteen years. Um, And, and now is, is seeing improvement after the liposuction. So would a pump or lymphatic massage be helpful? It definitely sounds like it. Um, with lymphedema, there is no one protocol. Everybody is different. Uh, some people respond very well to a pump. Some people just don't have benefits. Some people respond very well to massage. So a lot of this is close working with your lymphedema therapist. Um, having a good lymphedema therapist is, is solid gold. Um, they're um, extremely dedicated and I've learned a lot, um, but a lot of it is trial and error. Uh, can I get liposuction if the swelling comes back? That would be a case by case with your surgeon. Um, how long after liposurgery is it going to be as good as it's going to get? Um, I think at six months, 
you kind of see where you're going to be, but I have seen improvements beyond then. And a lot of it really depends on the patient and lymphedema therapist and how well they're working together, uh, making sure the compression is consistent. So, um, so this says in the, how do you reassure funders and patients that this is not experimental? Um, so this is a plastic surgeon um, in London where the procedures are not funded by the NHS. I think it's a great question. And I, I'm not trying to convince anybody um, that this is of anything. Um, I, I just wanted, it took me about 10 years personally to answer the question, does this actually work? And so I don't think it's a, appropriate to call it experimental when you have at least 17 prospective studies on, on lymph node transplant, other um, similar studies on lymphovenous bypass at this point. I would say probably about seven years ago, I totally agree with you. I think that um, you just have to ask the patients themselves, does it work and present data honestly with sober eyes um, and and see how to advance the field. The only other alternative is just not to offer the patient anything. And so I think that's a pretty rough deal if you're a patient that's told there's nothing you can do, just wrap it up for the rest of your life. We're not gonna even try because um, we don't have a 100% success rate. Um, I had a Nissen fundoplication, which is a mouthful, but I had severe reflux, chronic pneumonia and all this stuff. And my uh, chief, chief uh, actually operated on me when I was a resident. And I looked at the data and the data looked horrible on this procedure, wrapping your stomach around the esophagus. There were some high complication rates and some high failure rates. And I asked him, you know, should I even do this procedure? It, it's not nowhere near a hundred percent. So he said, well, a lot of the procedures were done on the wrong patient. They just did them on patients with heartburn, which could be anything from uh, cardiac ischemia to, to reflux and something else. So I, I think like I see lymphatic surgery as that type of surgery where we have to figure out which specific patient is really going to benefit from it. And then our hit rate, our success rate will go um, higher and higher. And so much progress has been made. Um, now there's standing room only at the American Society for Reconstructive Microsurgery packed with surgeons who want to get into lymphedema. And I think that's a I think that's a good thing. I think it's important to be open and honest about uh, results, complications, and um, success and failure, and review them critically for the benefit of the patient. Um, if I got lymphedema, um, you know, it's the end of my career. So I think, as just a society, we're 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 obliged to try to find uh, a solution. But I wish you great success, and uh, you're welcome to visit. Uh, I'll share everything we have. Um, we're very open, and I'm very excited to talk to anybody who who uh, is interested in, in uh, advancing um, the treatment for lymphedema. The, the number of lymphatic bypasses we are targeting, the average LVB, usually we're getting two good lymphovenous bypasses at a time. Um, it really depends on what the patient has to give. So um, it totally depends on the imaging. And I would take one or two um, good lymphovenous bypasses over four or five little tiny scarred lymphovenous bypasses. So the quality and quantity were important. Um, so the, the green substance, that's that was what was that substance injected into the lymphatic system? That's ICG, uh, endocyanine green dye. It's widely available. Um, it's FDA approved for perfusion. It's off-label for lymphatic imaging, but everybody in lymphatic surgery, it's it's pretty much standard of care. Um, I think, I, unfortunately, I can't, I can't really answer specific questions regarding specific patient cases because it, it's um, beyond the scope of this. I would, uh, you would have to go to your local lymphatic surgeon for an in-person in uh, evaluation. So how long does bypass surgery last? Does the bypass stop working? If so, is another surgery required? Uh, I think this is a question that's still... Um, this the jury is still out, but I have had long term successes. I'm I would say the longest term success I've had is probably about six or seven years now. But the way we do lymphovenous bypass has changed, so I think our success rate and how we do it is much more sophisticated than it was back then. 
But I do see long-term results from lymphovenous bypass. On the other hand, there clearly have been failures, you know, after a year or two. Um, you know, something like an infection can wreck uh, and can set you back. Um, how, how successful has surgery been on a patient with primary bilateral lower extremity lymphedema? A great, great question. Uh, primary lymphedema is, is, encompasses such a wide variety of uh, problems because all it really means is that we presume you have some kind of impaired lymphatic function that you were born with. And at some point in your life, the straw broke the camel's back and the lymphatic system couldn't compensate. And so, um, so uh, you develop swelling. Um, but that could be caused by pump a problem with the pumping mechanism. It could be caused because you weren't born with a normal number of lymph nodes, which we've seen on imaging. Uh, it can be, it can be caused because of an abnormality in, in your lymphatic system, uh, any, any variety of them. So it's hard, it's hard to give a general answer, um, to that question. Intermittent fasting also has similar effect on GLP-1. Um, I'm not an expert on on um, uh, nutrition or intermittent fasting, but I'm aware of it. I I, I read a lot on all of this stuff. As um, uh, my own blood blood sugar depends on it, um, but I think that clearly, if there's non medical and non surgical way to uh, reverse lymphedema and treat it, then I would do that first. Uh, we encourage all of our patients um, to uh, get on a nutrition program. Um, and an exercise program, get enough sleep, control their glucose naturally. Um, the reality is, is that there's been um, lives saved because of many medications. Um, I'm on a, a cholesterol-lowering medication. That's a life-saving medication. You diet, and diet, and exercise just haven't done it for me. So I think um, while that works for a lot of people, um, there are going to be people that it just they fall through the cracks. And um, I think there's a role for both. Um, so uh, this is a good question. So this is a patient who has a solid component of the disease. So uh, a fat dominant limb, how would liposuction affect future lymphovenous bypass? Um, actually, we've seen bypassable lymphatics after SAPL, after a significant reduction in liposuction. The concern was certainly that with all that liposuction, aren't you going to destroy the lymphatics? Um, but that's a question. And I think that the main thing is uh, imaging those patients afterward. So I'm not aware, there may have been a publication on this, I'm not aware of any, but I think it's a very important question to research uh, what do the lymphatics look like on ICG after or other means after liposuction. So I, 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 can't, I can't give you a percentage. Um, so this patient is saying, I'm newly on Manjaro. Um, are you saying it could possibly help or make it worse? I'm saying that it could possibly help. We know that weight gain uh, worsens lymphatic function and can worsen lymphedema. And there's uh, published evidence showing that significant weight loss, not a mild uh, five to eight pound weight loss, but a significant weight loss can can improve. Obviously, you want to do that safely. So it may it may benefit you, um, but needs to be studied. I'm not making any claims at this point. We don't have the prospective data. So this is a question, this is from a lymphedema therapist, love our lymphedema therapists, um, about ICG um, in, in Arizona. There aren't any physicians really, really doing ICG or willing to collaborate, any suggestions. Um, looking for experienced microsurgery options for patients. Um, is there a registry of surgeons doing lymph node transplant and lymphovenous anastomosis? Um, actually, there is at the Learn website, so it's a great question, and I think it's a phenomenal resource. Um, and the people at Learn have done a phenomenal job. Uh, you can look for centers of excellence, and you'll find a list of uh, microsurgeons that offer those procedures. With um, So this is a, a very good question. With the lymphovenous bypass, lymph that did not go through the lymph node is not filtered. 
So when it's forwarded to a vein, does it somehow affect the body? Great, great question. Um, I would just say that after you remove all the axillary lymph nodes, effectively all the lymph that's exiting that arm is not getting filtered through the lymph nodes anymore. So you kind of have, I don't know what the specific effect, if there's any, if there's any negative systemic effect, but, a, but, a, but we have not really observed that there've been, you know, many, many thousands of axillary and inguinal lymph node dissections. None of those lymphatics are, are now getting filtered through any lymph node basin. So, um, and many thousands of lymphovenous bypasses have been performed. So if there is an effect, I haven't seen, haven't seen uh, any, any significant clinical effect, but if you know of one, um, I would definitely want to hear it. How well do these techniques work for congenital lymphedema or primary lymphedema? Um, I think it depends on the case. Again, there's so many uh, types of congenital lymphedemas. So um, basically, if there's a mechanical lymphatic vessel you can bypass, I think a bypass would work. If you have a thoracic duct uh, that that has a very focal, like it just wasn't developed, and there's a very focal point where you can identify the thoracic duct and plug it into a vein. Uh, I think it's I think it um, it could be effective. Um, okay, so um, this is a question on research, which I love. So we named this Institute for Lymphatic Surgery and Innovation because innovation is really. Um, is really the is really looking forward in the future, and by definition, anything new is not going to have long term uh, data. When we first started doing this, there was no long term data on lymphatic surgery. But the core driver for this is that we see patients when a patient's coming to you in the office and they're in tears about an incurable and progressive condition, um, and there's and there's they're looking for an option. Um, you know, the only hope is future technology is really um, the next. Uh, the next thing. So I think um, ways to actually measure lymphatic transport and function, like how do you measure an outcome? It's one of the biggest barriers to advancing the field. So if we have a very clear, reproducible, open, easily accessible, widely accessible, and inexpensive way to measure lymphatic transport, how well your lymphatic system is functioning. Is it functioning at 90%? Is it functioning at 10%? Um, that would allow us really to compare what's working, what's not working with much more fidelity and accuracy. Imaging is very important. The lymphatic system is all over the place from the brain to the heart, to the liver. So the lymphatic system is probably involved in many other disease states. Um, they're looking at neurologic diseases, but it's probably involved in in, in an all organ system dysfunction to some degree. So I think being able to image it uh, will allow us to understand. And then finally, finally, I think medical, medical um, and minimally invasive surgical uh, treatments. Um, this is a semaglutide trials if they're, if they're out there for breast cancer patients. Um, I've just been doing this one-to-one -one writing a letter to the insurer um, as it relates to lymphedema. Um, if the patient had a clear weight gain and the lymphedema got exacerbated and we actually track that um, and we have data on that, then um, we've we've been able to be successful once in a while, but I'm not aware of any open trials now. We're, we're, we're in the process of launching a prospective study on GLP-1 receptor agonists. So that will be probably launching um, by by the end of year, this year or early next year. So um, regarding secondary lymphedema, how early would you want to see the patients and how early would you recommend surgery? We actually prefer to see the patient before they are even having axillary dissection so we can get baseline measurements and we will actually do surveillance. We use, and I have no relationship with so Sozo, but we'll use the Sozo just as a monitoring device. Um, this way, at the earliest sign of any problem, we can intervene. Um, it used to be thought that you only do surgery at the very end, but if you wait to very advanced disease, you just have less to work with. Uh, there's less to reconstruct. Um, so we would prefer to intervene earlier. At the same time, you have to be very careful because for early stage lymphedema, you could make somebody worse 
if you're bypassing a part of the lymphatic system that's still working. So the imaging workup becomes very, you know, becomes very, very critical. We do a fairly extensive, uh, extensive job. Um, for, um, for any um, ap appointments and stuff, um, I'm, I'm Googleable, but um, but I also uh, I think this is a field where um, there are there are, there are lymphatic surgeons more and more popping up, and um, I'm always happy to see I'm always happy to see a patient or always happy to have a colleague visit uh, as I love visiting other colleagues. Um, so is there an uh, a fellowship training? We've just launched this. We ultimately want a fellowship program, but right now, um, right now we're focusing on on developing the actual the actual program. Uh, we just launched um, just a few months ago, but I would love to have fellows. So, um, could you clarify if I have primary lower extremity and venous insufficiency, why I wouldn't be a candidate for lymph node transplant? The for, and this is just from my my perspective and my experience um, is that I don't want to do surgery on a patient that's likely not going to work. It's a it's it's exposing the patient to risk, um, and we're not doing any favors. And the reason why is if you have venous insufficiency, there's a lot of back pressure in in the veins. Um, it means your valves are not working, so blood is rushing back uh, back down to your feet towards your feet. Um, when you do a lymph node transplant, you're transplanting the lymph nodes. The lymph nodes act as a sponge that will suck lymph. But where does that lymph go? Out the lymph node and into the vein. Now, if there's a lot of back pressure from the vein, uh, blood pushing back, the lymph isn't going to be able to go out the vein. You you know, things run from high pressure to low pressure. So you need a, a, a normal venous system has a low pressure system. Um, it doesn't mean that at 100% it wouldn't work. It just means that I'm just speaking from my own experience and I, I don't want to expose a patient to risk of something that has a very high chance of not working. Um, the risk benefit of surgery has to be there. And ultimately, you should be evaluated um, by your own doctor. Have you ever had a failed patient from another surgeon qualify for a different or second go since we have more information and technology now? Would insurance cover another one? Um, I think all of us have had failures, myself included. Um, and certainly I've seen uh, failures um, that have came from a patient had a you know surgery done. It just didn't work. Um, I've had patients that I've done surgery. It just didn't work. And it's normal to have a second or third or even a fourth opinion. Um, so I do think that technology does has improved a lot over the last few years. For us, I think the biggest leap has been the ultra high frequency ultrasound, uh, where you can see lymphatic vessels on the ultrasound and the relationship to the veins. And I can, I, I can do a more precise surgical plan. I think our insights into the physiology, like the actual direction of the motion of the, the lymph, uh, which direction is this going, uh, has improved, how to deal with venous back bleeding and all these technical issues. So I don't think it necessarily excludes you from a second surgery. We have done second surgeries on patients, but I'm very, very careful. Normally, as always, I would refer the patient back to their original surgeon. Um, I think um, the original surgeon needs definitely an opportunity to um, assess, to assess you, um, and to um, offer um, a solution if it's reasonable, um, but have to proceed very, very carefully. Um, you know, when operating uh, a second time, so that I'm very, you know, very selective. As with any patient, I just want to make sure. Bottom line, if I was in the patient's position, would I do this surgery on my? Would I want somebody to do this surgery on me? Um, is it safe and and it, is it likely to work or is it just a shot in the dark? If it's a shot in the dark, I'm, I'm, I'm I wouldn't do it. Um, oh, so uh, this is on microsurgical robots. Uh, great question. Um, so I'm a I'm 
I will be open, I'm, I'm, I'm biased towards new technology, not to just adopt it, but to at least expose myself to it and try it. Um, until you actually use it, you really, uh, it's easy to dismiss something um, on the outset. Um, until you actually start using it, then you're, then I find my eyes open and I can see applications or, or where this might work. But with any new technology, there's going to be a period of discovery. The microsurgical robot basically eliminates tremor, which is a limitation, a human limitation for all of us. Um, and it also limits the uh, availability of things like lymphovenous bypass, um, because out of all plastic surgeons, a small subset do microsurgery, and out of all microsurgeons, a smaller subset do the so-called super microsurgery, which is operating on, on a fraction of a millimeter. And it's technically difficult. And I would love technology that completely eliminates my own uh, human limitations. So I have used the robot in a, in a demonstration setting, but not on a patient. Uh, there is one robot um, that is uh, now FDA approved. And I'm actually looking to um, collaborate and and actually uh, start start um, start using it. But um, I, I think it's I think it's great. I think there's I think there's a lot of potential, uh, but I can't really comment on outcomes and things like that at this point. Standard protocol for post-op lymphedema therapy treatment. No. And the reason is, is because everybody's lymphedema is different. So um, we entertained standard protocols early, early on, but we quickly realized that what works for one person can hurt another person. And so um, I think that the experts are not the surgeons, but the lymphedema therapists in terms of lymphedema therapy. For sure, the surgeon needs to communicate and work closely as a partner with the lymphedema therapist so they understand what surgery was done and what we what our goal is, um, both preoperatively and postoperatively. But how to get to that goal, the lymphedema therapist and the patient working together are the best because they're they're gonna have the instant feedback of what's working, what's not working. Sometimes there's a little trial and error there. What I can say as a surgeon is the most common problem I see is a patient will come and they said, I tried lymphedema therapy and I, I got a custom garment and it made my lymphedema worse. Almost always, or in, in the majority of cases, it's because the garment didn't fit. And um, many patients don't realize that just one fitting, even if it's custom, does not guarantee um, that the garment fits. Oftentimes, when you put that garment on and you're moving in the real world, there can be some parts of the day where it's more swollen, less swollen, and that garment may be pinching around the wrist or around the knee and causing a tourniquet effect. And if you have a tightness around that area, you're going to have, um, you're going to have swelling downstream. So if you have a tourniquet around your wrist, the, the hand will swell. So um, uh, you should have you should go back to the lymphedema therapist with the garment on and show them where it's too tight or if it's painful, you shouldn't be wearing it. Um, it needs to be adjusted and get another garment. So um, sometimes the insurance will, will cover for a second or third fitting. I think it's really important and some lymphedema therapists actually do their own garment fitting. So you have the feedback loop and you don't just sort of get sent to the garment center uh, a random person will fit you, you get your garment, and then you you kind of sail off. But um, I think there's so much in the world of lymphedema therapy, um, and it's really an, an art um, and important to, to get a good one. Uh, where can you get a lymph ultrasound? Ultra high frequency ultrasound is unfortunately not widely available uh, yet. Um, it is... Uh, um, that's that's the downside of it. Um, there's only a handful of places in the U.S. that do it. Um, I, I would start with the Center of Excellence, um, a list at Learn, and and um, go from there. So the name of the deep ultrasound machine for diagnostics um, is the ultra high frequency ultrasound. Um, it's this is unfortunately not a test you get from a radiologist. It's really from a lymphatic surgeon in almost all cases. So for setting up a surgical center for lymphedema, which are the minimum devices you need? 
for determining lymphedema and then surgery, ICG, lymphocentigraphy, MRL, parameter, BIS. So a great question. Um, I can just tell you what what we what we use. I, I think if you're setting up a center, it's good to offer both surveillance for lymphedema for patients that are high risk, like patients that are getting an axillary or groin dissection. And, and, and for that, the quick and easiest thing is uh, bioimpedance. Um, uh, we use the SOZO, so it take, they step on, it takes a minute, it gives them a whole breakdown of their body composition and a number, and, and it's something you can easily track um, if you're in a high volume place, um, efficiency is important. Um, ICG for us is like an x-ray for an orthopedic surgeon. So we have the ICG in the office. I think that's ideal because we can, the patient can directly look at their lymphatic system right there. Um, lymphocentigraphy and MRL are tests that we order with our colleagues in nuclear medicine and radiology. Um, I, I use both of them. I don't always 100% of the time use everything, but ICG pretty much on, on everybody kind of depends. Uh, I don't use the parameter. I used to use the parameter. We had um, some, some issues with it. Um, I mean, for some people, it works great. I think as long as you use something, just stick, just stick with it. Um, we use manual measurements, but that can be inefficient and there's variability. Most recently, we're using something called Lymphotech, um, this was um, developed by Brandon Dixon and his group. There's a, I'm, um, um, I apologize, I can't remember the names, but uh, it's great. Uh, we use it now as standard. So it's basically you take an iPad, you um, go around the patient with the iPad, and it gives you a 3D volume rendering. It gives you the actual limb volume. It automatically calculates the levels and the cutoffs, so you don't have to do calibration. Uh, you have to calibrate the parameter. You have to sort of self-calibrate if you're doing manual measurements, how far up the limb you're taking measurements. This does it all for you, and you get a chart. I think the patients like it, and it's efficient. Can we get a link to the research studies you showed in the slides? Um, I can I can definitely work with um, Phyllis to do that. I'm not sure. I don't want to say yes because I'm not on the technical end on the Learn website. But um, I could I could definitely provide those and and more. Uh, there are many uh, talented surgeons and co colleagues around the world that have published published a, a lot. Um, central lymphatic reconstruction using thoracic duct lymphovenous anastomosis. So I think I think if it makes mechanical sense and it's physically possible, um, and it looks like that's the problem, then I would I would do a lymphovenous bypass. That being said. I have not personally, um, I've done thoracic duct lymphovenous anastomosis, but not on specifically like a pediatric patient. Um, it definitely works uh, uh, if you have a lymphatic duct and, and that, is, that is a large duct um, that's obstructed and you plug it into a vein and the rest of the lymphatic is, is normal. Like it's not all scar down the road. It's, it's open up to a point plugging into a vein um, should work. And I, th I think, I think it's worth, I think it's worth doing. It's a t highly technical procedure, depends where along the thoracic duct. So it can be a very invasive procedure. Um, definitely not, not a, a walk in the park. Um, yes, I perform all of these, all of these surgeries we've been performing for the past uh, 15 or so years. So what are the outcomes for primary lymphedema patients, similar or different? Again, I think um, it's very difficult to say. Most of my data, honestly, in the past 10 years have been at a cancer center, so I didn't see many primary patients, so I couldn't comment on my own experience. Um, now I'm seeing a lot more primary patients. Um, I think it's more common than people think. Um, I definitely think that it's a more unknown uh, area. So if you're applying a surgery to a known area, probably your um, outcomes are gonna be more consistent than to an unknown, a lesser known area. But by how much, how different and the outcomes, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't say. Uh, Post-op course, so that depends for the, the type of surgery. For lymphovenous bypass is the easiest, it's outpatient. It's usually pretty painless or minimal pain. It basically amounts to a couple of paper cuts. Um, they're, they're, they're not, um, not not much of a recovery. 
Um, from a lymphedema therapy perspective, uh, we mainly do massage for the first two weeks without much of any compression. And then after two weeks, we get them back into uh, decongestive therapy, uh, uh, compression, uh, wrapping, um, and down into a garment. Um, sometimes the patient has a very good and quick response. We just did an international patient last week, and she's doing, thankfully, very well. Um, she noticed an immediate response just a couple of days after surgery. Um, for lymph node transplant, um, pretty much the same protocol, but it's a bigger recovery. Um, I'd say it takes more like uh, like a cut, like two uh, two weeks or three weeks to like really feel good. Liposuction can even be a longer recovery because you're taking a lot of tissue, especially a very large lower extremity. Um, it is a big recovery. I think that's the the hardest recovery, but also very um, very satisfying. Uh, do I have um, recommend recommendations? Um, um, Anti-inflammatory diet. Um, recommendations of lymphedema therapists. That there are many good lymphedema therapists in the New York City area and other areas. I don't. I don't want to make any. Um, you know, one one specific endorsement. But I think that some of the nice things. Some of the nice things that I, I've seen in terms of outcomes are there are lymphedema therapists that will sort of rip it like a Band-Aid and have the ability to see a patient five days a week through decongestive therapy for like two weeks instead of two to three times a week for four or five weeks. Not everybody can do that. Not everybody has the you know capacity that's a lot of time per patient. But every time you go, the patients report to us that they're making gains well, if you only go a couple times a week, they'll wrap you, it gets good, and then it starts to swell, the wrap loosens up, and then you're you're sort of making up some of the loss and then a little bit of gain um, over a longer period of time. Again, I, I can't really comment on, on what's better. The other way may be just as good or better in different patients, but these are what patients tell us. The other thing is some uh, lymphedema therapists do offer um, measuring their own garments and are, are very involved in the garment and rechecking the garment. Um, whether you're measuring your own garments or not, I think those therapists that are um, having the patient come back and reevaluate um, are really great. I, we love working with a lot of different therapists and we have them come in and actually they're welcome to see the ICG on their own patients so they can see um, what tech, you know, what manual lymphatic drainage technique is actually working. Some patients with stubborn disease need more aggressive uh, therapy. Um, so as someone who has secondary lymphedema for 20 years and is in menopause struggling a little with BMI, should I pursue blood glucose monitoring and insulin resistance? as an next logical step? Um, that's a great question. I honestly think everybody in the entire population should try continuous blood glucose monitoring for a few weeks because prediabetes and diabetes is just so common now. Um, it, for, forget about the BMI. I'm not, um, 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 I, I have a low BMI and I have you know hard to control diabetes. Um, and so the GLP-1, for me and the continuous glucose monitoring for me has been a godsend. And I thought that I was eating stuff that was healthy, like oatmeal, uh, you know, bananas, these things shot my sugar way up. So it's great to have instant feedback of what you put in your mouth and what it's directly doing to your body's metabolism. Um, and if only I had that 20 years ago, I think I could have dodged, dodged a bullet. Um, so I think the, you know, modern American diet, um, of which I ate, you know, terribly, um, particularly in surgical residency and in up to, up to recently, um, I think it's good to have that feedback. Um, so I think that's a great first step. Uh, I had 12 lymph nodes taken out of my left groin. Um, are either of these surgeries dead for me? Um, I, n no, I don't, I don't think so. Um, I think the, I think that if I'm not sure if you have lymphedema or or do not yet have lymphedema, I'd say that um, if you do not have lymphedema, what we typically would do, if you're not having any symptoms, we would do surveillance with a bioimpedance 
Um, or if there was some concern, we would even do an ICG baseline to see your lymphatic system. And then we would follow up with that ICG in another six months. If there was, you know, deterioration of the lymphatic system and you had symptoms um, of lymphedema, then I think you could you could intervene. But I'm um, um, I'm, I'm not sure I know the your the whole clinical scenario, and it really you'd have to see a, a specialist. So if you have lymphedema, uh, dyskinesis, primary lymphedema, when your limbs start to swell in your teens, would a procedure like LVA stop the disease, or would it continue to progress? Um, it's it's hard. Uh, honestly, it's hard for me to say. I I don't know. Um, I do I do think that. Um, like in order to answer that question, we would need a lot of patients like yourself in a prospective study. So to answer it honestly, I I I would just be speculating. I do think that if you saw a lymphatic that ends in a dead end and could be bypassed, and you have a normal venous system, it's um, it's probably worthwhile uh, uh, attempting. So what is the best manage for management for cases with post groin lymph node dissection after excision? Uh, a reconstruction of a post-burn marginal ulcer in the foot, develop lymphedema and heel ulceration, recurrence is excluded. That's a hard one. I'd really need to see the specific, you know, the specific case. So I've heard of cases where lymph node transfer was done prophylactically on breast cancer patients, and that breast reconstruction was also done at the same time. Can breast reconstruction normally be done at the same time as breast cancer surgery? Uh, yes, uh, typically breast reconstruction is done at the same time as breast cancer surgery. And I did show a case of a paper we published where we performed the deep flap reconstruction as well as the axillary reconstruction using an omentum lymph node transplant. Um, and it also, it fills out that hollow. Um, it, it, it eliminated the, it, it prevented contracture um, and, you know, reconstructed the lymphatic system. So that's, that's an option, but each specific case has to be reviewed with a surgeon. Everybody's different. Do you recommend anti-inflammatory diet to improve outcomes? I think that um, as long as the diet's safe, there's little downside to trying it. So, um, but I think that no one diet fits everybody. That's what I learned. I tried a vegan diet with my friends who were hardcore vegan. My blood sugar was through the roof. So I think the details of the diet, like Anti-inflammatory diet can mean very different things to different people. Um, I wasn't eating a healthy vegan diet. I was eating like a high carb vegan diet. So um, it's hard for me to endorse any diet. I think you have to look at your own metabolism, but if the diet is safe and healthy, I think it's reasonable to try. Do you anticipate that GLP-1 would help for primary lymphedema patient of normal weight? That's a great question. I don't know. Um, GLP-1 interestingly, has publications that it's cardioprotective, meaning that it has beneficial um, protective um, effects on the coronary arteries and the actual vessel wall. And we actually looked in the mechanism of action of GLP-1, and there will be another talk uh, we'll give um, in December that's going to be dedicated to this topic. So, and I think it'll be very, it'll be very interesting. We're going to go deep into all the data that's published, but GLP-1, I think may not only work by weight loss, but also directly on the lymphatic system or indirectly on the lymphatic system. It, it targets the uh, T cells, the same part of the immune system that's responsible for the development of lymphedema uh, and can cool them down. It affects insulin um, signaling, uh, which is which is a factor in lymphatic function. So there may be direct effects, and we just don't know. We'd have to do a prospective study. Um, patients with radiotherapy, um, most of our patients have been radiated, so it's kind of standard. Um, any lymphedema surgery covered by medical insurance? Um, does Medicare cover these procedures? Honestly, I'm not a Medicare um, coverage expert, so I don't know. Um, there are some carriers that do cover lymphatic surgery. Uh, we certainly um, work with all insurance companies, and I speak to a lot of uh, medical directors and do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer discussion, basically showing the the data. Um, I think that's I think that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your questions um, and your patience. Um, I I hope I was clear and. I really wish everybody the best. And I have many thanks to 
many talented um, surgical, medical, and lymphedema therapy colleagues and researchers uh, around around the world. Um, it's an exciting time, and I'm hopeful for uh, the future um, of lymphedema and hopefully a cure. Thank you.